Hi everyone, welcome to the last chapter of the course. This chapter will be divided into two parts. It is about asymmetric information. This is one of the conditions for perfect competition to occur. So in this chapter, we are going to violate the perfect information assumption. In particular, we will look at the impact of information being asymmetric on market outcomes. Today, in the first part, we are going to talk about adverse selection, and as a byproduct, we will uh, get into signaling. And in the next part, we will talk about moral hazard, and I will explain the difference between the two. First, the disclaimer. I do not allow this content to be published without my consent. If I see this content online, I will take it down and report whoever uploaded it. So, the outline of the lecture will be as follows. First, I will define what adverse selection is. Then, I will talk about an example of adverse selection. In particular, I will talk about the uh, original model of adverse selection, which is the lemons market. Then, I will get into signaling as a, a way to mitigate adverse selection problems. And I will use a model of education as a signal, which is also the original signaling model, um, to look at the impact of signaling on the, um, on the market outcomes. In particular, I will talk about two types of equilibria, a separating equilibrium and a pooling equilibrium. So, before I talk about the actual definition of adverse selection, let me give you a couple of stylized facts. Those are facts that we commonly see in, um, in reality, and we're going to try to explain those facts using asymmetric information. The first um, fact is about used cars. Even if they are like new, they sell far below the dealership price. Laid off workers experience longer spells of unemployment than workers without a job for different reasons. And in fact, the longer you are unemployed, the harder it is to find a job. It, is, uh, it has been shown empirically. So if you are to be unemployed at some point, try to find a job rather quickly or try to do something else like maybe go back to school or train yourself. That is always a good asset if you want to get a new job later. Private health care for the elderly is essentially unavailable. And we will also um, kind of explain where asymmetric information um, kicks in. Corporate rates, so in general, group rates for insurance policies are lower than individual rates. And so what do these empirical regularities have in common? Well, spoiler, it's going to be adverse selection. Adverse selection is the outcome of a situation where one or several agents have hidden knowledge about some characteristics that will matter when interacting with other agents. For instance, consumers know privately their willingness to pay for a good, or individuals who go get insurance know better the probability of them having an accident. Or an applicant for a job knows about his own ability, but the employer does not necessarily know. So the idea is that one side of the market, one side of the transaction, is going to have some knowledge that the other side doesn't have. Now, sometimes, Agents have an incentive to keep that information secret. For instance, a bad driver doesn't want to tell his car insurance uh, that he is a bad driver. He wants to make them believe that he is a good driver to benefit from cheaper rates. Sometimes, however, agents want to communicate that information to other agents. Think about, for instance, a recent graduate from Harvard. 
he will want employers to know where he studied because coming from Harvard is a good, well, signal, and I will get to um, signaling in the second part of the lecture, is a good signal of the ability of the applicant. The information asymmetry can lead to market failures. So trade does not occur, although it would be Pareto efficient if it did, or contracts are not signed, although it would be Pareto efficient that they are. So the outcome might not be Pareto efficient. So how does hidden knowledge lead to this adverse selection problem? In order to understand this, I'm going to show you the original model, the lemons market. George Akerlof in 1970 made the first asymmetric information model where he talked about the asymmetric information about the quality of a car in the market for used cars, hence the name Market for Lemons. Arkelov, by the way, got the Nobel Prize in 2001 with Joseph Stiglitz precisely for that contribution and the rest, and of course the rest of his contributions to the literature. So let's start with two parties. We have a seller S and a buyer B. They are both risk neutral. Making them both risk neutral is just going to make the computations easier. But if they were risk averse or risk loving, things would be exactly the same. The seller owns a car, so it is a used car. The car can have two possible qualities, and each quality can happen with equal probability. The car could be a good condition car, so we call that a peach. In this case, the quality Q will be equal to QH. The car otherwise could be in a bad condition, and in this case it's called a lemon or a sausage. In this case the quality is equal to QL. Now, we need to define utilities, or at least willingnesses to pay and willingnesses to sell. A peach, which is a good quality car, is worth $4,000 to a buyer. So the valuation of a buyer for a high quality car, H is for high, is equal to $4,000. So a buyer is willing to pay at most $4,000 for a good car. A seller is willing to sell a good car for $3,000. Now, for lemons, of course, both the buyer and the sellers will be to respectively buy and sell for a lower price. A buyer is only willing to pay up to $1,000 for, for a bad quality car, or low quality, L is for low, and a seller is willing to sell a bad quality car for at least $500. So if the seller can sell it for more, he's going to be happier. If the buyer can buy it for less, he's going to be happier as well, and he will have a positive surplus. Now, before we get into the asymmetric information part, let's look at whether trade of any type of car is Pareto efficient or not. In both of these, uh, for both of these quality levels, the buyer is willing to pay a higher price than the price the seller is willing to sell the car for. So, it is efficient that no matter the quality of the car, that the car is traded. So the efficient allocation is that the car is sold regardless of the quality as buyers are willing to pay more for each type than sellers are willing to sell them for. Any questions so far? This is just the uh, description of the model. Now we're going to get into the analysis of the model and we're going to change the information structure. First, we're going to assume that everybody knows the quality of a car, then we're going to assume that nobody knows the quality of the car, and then finally we're going to assume that one side of the market knows about the quality of the car and the other side doesn't.
So first, let's assume that information is perfect. So both the buyer and the seller observe the quality of the car. Imagine that the, sell, the car is up for sale on Craigslist. The buyer can see the pictures and he can guess already if the car is a peach or a lemon. Well, in this case, they can simply negotiate a price that is going to depend on the quality. If the car is a good car, then any price between $3,000 and $4,000 is a price that both the seller and the buyer will mutually agree upon. More than $3,000 is good for the seller and less than $4,000 is good for the buyer. If instead the car is a lemon, then any price between 500 and 1000 should do the deal. Then how is this price negotiated? That, is a dep that depends on the structure of the market. They could be that there are more um, buyers than there are sellers. So sellers can sell the car for the highest possible price which is going to be $4,000 and $1,000. Or you could say that there are less, well, there are more sellers than there are buyers. So there are more cars to sell than uh, buyers who want to buy them. So the buyers will have a higher bargaining power and they might be able to lower the price all the way down to $3,000 or $500. Okay? And again here, Trade is efficient because it is going to happen. Whatever the quality of the car, the car is going to be sold. Then how the bargaining is going to happen, that's another uh, matter. And that's not the point of, um, of this model. They can use quotient bargaining. They can use the structure of the supply and the demand. So they can use the structure of the market, whatever. But a price in these ranges will um will seal the deal now imagine that information is imperfect but it is symmetric so nobody knows the quality of the car so even the seller does not know if what he's selling is a good car or a bad car. The seller, imagine, is uh, pretty bad at knowing the quality of a car. He has no idea. He just knows that he wants to sell his car. So in this case, for both parties, the quality of the car is as good as random. And the as good as random part is very, very important. We know that there is a probability of 50% that a car is a good car and a probability of 50% that, that a car is a bad car. Because both sellers and buyers do not know the quality of the car that is being sold, the price can no longer depend on the quality. Note here that the price depends on the quality. The price will be between 3000 and 4000 if it's a good car, and between 500 and 1000 if it's a bad car. Since nobody knows about the quality of the car, this is not possible anymore. Now, if something is uncertain, we saw in the previous lecture about uncertainty, about actually risk, that agents can use expected willingness to pay or expected utility. So, a buyer will compute his own expected willingness to pay it will not be $4,000 or $1,000. It will be something in between, depending on the relative amount of good cars versus bad cars. So if you take the average of 4,000 and 1,000, it's an average because there is 50% of the cars are good cars and 50% of the cars are bad cars. The average is equal to $2,500. Now, the seller does not know the quality of the car either, so he's also going to compute an average. He's going to take the average between 
$3,000 and $500. And that average is equal to $1,750. Note that the average willingness to pay of the buyer is bigger than the average willingness to sell of the seller. So again, they can negotiate a price between $1,750 and $2,500. And that price will be mutually agreed upon. So the buyer will buy the car, seller will manage to sell his car, and it doesn't matter if it's a good car or a bad car, it is going to be sold. So in fact, again, trade is going to be efficient because it is going to happen. But note that none of them knows the quality of the car. So the problem is not so much that information is imperfect, because if nobody knows about it, trade can still be efficient. It could be that the average willingness to pay is lower than the average willingness to sell, in which case trade would be inefficient. It is entirely possible. But if the average is bigger, then trade will be efficient. Now, the more crunchy part is if information is imperfect, but asymmetric. In general, it is fair to assume that the seller knows the quality of what he's selling, but not necessarily the buyer. So here we assume that the seller only can observe the quality of his car. He knows what kind of car is selling, if it's a peach or if it's a lemon. The buyer has no idea. Because the buyer has no idea, he is going to make an expectation. The seller, however, does not need an ex any expectation because there is no risk for the seller. So imagine first that the car is a peach. Well, if the car is a peach, the seller is willing to uh, sell the car for minimum $3,000 that part. The seller knows it's a peach, so there is no expectation in this, um, in this line. Now, when it comes to the buyer, we need to take the expectation into account because the buyer doesn't know what car he is currently looking at. So the buyer will buy the car if the price of a car is lower than his expected willingness to pay. So if the price is lower than 2500 the buyer is okay with the car. But if the price is higher than $3,000, then the seller will be okay with selling the car. So we need both conditions to be simultaneously satisfied in order for trade to happen. However, these two conditions are not compatible. There is no price which is lower than $2,500 and bigger than $3,000 at the same time. So there is no price that the buyer and the seller will find mutually acceptable. So a peach will not be sold. Trade will be inefficient. Well, in fact, there will, they will not be any trade. So let's think about it from a market perspective. Let's look at what is going on. Well, if sellers want to sell their peach, they're going to put a price of at least $3,000. But at this price, there is no buyer who's willing to pay for the car because they're willing to pay only $2,500 for the car, not knowing the type of car they are looking at. So if the price is bigger than $3,000, there is excess supply. If you want demand to equal supply, you need prices to fall. But if the price falls below $3,000, then it cannot be a good car anymore. The seller must have a lemon if she accepts prices lower than $3,000. And the buyer knows the willingnesses to pay. 
The buyer doesn't know the quality of the car, but the buyer knows how much the seller is willing to sell each type of car for. So, if the buyer sees a lower price than $3,000, he concludes it's a lemon. If he concludes it's a lemon, then there is no risk associated to the quality anymore. It is not uncertain. And so, now, a buyer will be willing to pay the price for a lemon, which is at most $1,000. And so only prices between 500 and 1000 will be mutually acceptable. So what is going to happen at the end of the day is lemons will be sold, but peaches will not find any buyer. So only lemons are sold, peaches are not, so the peach market breaks down. And we saw at the beginning of the model that it was efficient that both types of cars are being traded, being sold. Because in both cases, the buyer is willing to pay more for the seller. However, not having this information, the buyer has to rely on his expected willingness to pay. And if his expected willingness to pay is lower than, um, than the um, willingness to sell of the seller, then trade will not happen. Buyers are at most willing to pay $1,000 only once they realize that if the price is lower than $3,000, it cannot be a peach, it has to be a lemon. So once the buyer knows, realizes that the car is a lemon, then he's not willing to pay $2,500 anymore, he's expected willingness to pay, now he's only willing to pay the maximum price for a lemon, which is $1,000, that was the assumption. So let's um, summarize and give other examples. Sellers not finding a buyer will want to lower the price. If they lower the price below a certain threshold, it will give a signal, it will give the information that uh, the good being sold is not a high quality good anymore. So if the price falls, high quality sellers will not be able to find a buyer they will drop out of the market and only low quality goods are going to remain. And this is what we call adverse selection. The adverse type, the low quality type, is the one that is being selected at the end. So the average quality deteriorates as the price falls and the maximum price buyers are willing to pay falls and the price falls further, so the market may in fact disappear entirely. So the consequence of hidden knowledge is that it can lead to total market failure. And if trade happens, it will be less than efficient. In this case, only lemons are sold. And the adverse type might be the only one involved in the trade. Hence the name adverse selection. Think about other examples. Labor markets, credit markets, insurance market. Let me give you, for instance, uh, the example for the credit market. Imagine that you have two types of borrowers. The risky type, the kind of borrower who's going to spend his money and gamble and might not be able to repay, and the safe borrower, somebody who's, who's been having a very clean credit history, somebody who wants to pay back on his mortgage uh, every month, somebody who, who will not default on the loan. The banker doesn't know which borrower he is looking at in the, in the meeting. So, he's going to apply an average interest rate. The average interest rate will be the average between 
the interest rate that they would charge to a risky borrower and the, uh, the interest rate they would charge to a, a safe borrower. However, this average might be this average interest rate might be too high for a safe borrower. So a safe borrower will not accept a loan. A safe borrower is the same as a high quality car. He is the good type. He will not accept the loan because the interest rate is too high. And seeing this, the banker will then conclude that if somebody accepts such an interest rate, that borrower must be a risky borrower. But then if the banker knows it's a risky borrower, he doesn't need to charge an average interest rate anymore. He can charge the high interest rate, the one they would charge to a risky borrower. And at the end of the day, only risky borrowers will take the loan. Safe borrowers will walk away. Again, adverse selection the type that ended up making a loan, getting the loan, getting the contract, is the risky type, the low type. You can do the same in insurance. You have somebody who's maybe at risk, maybe somebody whose um, immune system is uh, weaker, and somebody who is in tip-top shape. The insurance doesn't know who is in tip-top shape and who is not. They're going to offer an average insurance premium, but the average insurance premium might cost too much to a, a tip top shape customer. So the tip top shape customer walks away and only the risky customers are going to take the loan, the loan, the uh, insurance contract. But if they take the insurance contract and if they are, if they are um, weaker customers, then the insurance company will not charge an average premium anymore. It will charge a full premium. And again, only the uh, exposed um, customers, exposed in terms of like weakness and diseases and so on, will accept the insurance. For labor market, you can think about an applicant as being high quality or low quality, or maybe high productivity and low productivity. The employer has no way to know that yet. They are only meeting face-to-face -face job interview. So the employer will propose a wage in between because he's not sure whether it's a good, like highly productive worker or a not that highly productive worker. That wage might not be enough for a highly productive worker. He might walk away. And the only workers who are going to accept this contract will be maybe the uh, lower productivity workers. We have covered second degree price discrimination at the beginning of the semester. That is also an example of adverse selection. Consumers have private information on their willingness to pay. They know their type. Perfect price discrimination is Pareto efficient, but it's not possible anymore. So the monopolist needs to take into account different types of constraints for each type of customer to buy the bundle that targets them. And this is what we saw in assignment one and also in the problem set about price discrimination. We need to make sure that each type of customer will buy the bundle that targets them. If the monopolist does not take into account the fact that there are multiple possible deals, then only the low type bundles will be sold. And again, the high quality customers will walk away. Adverse selection. Dating. Marriage markets. You could have um, potential partners of different qualities. You don't know exactly at the beginning when you start dating them. This is something that, that you discover over time, but um, there's a similar idea behind, uh, behind dating and marriage markets. 
the idea of hidden knowledge. So, more generally, in markets that feature adverse selection, prices are going to be correlated with the source of asymmetry. For instance, in the market for lemons, the source of asymmetry is coming from the quality of the car. The price that you see at the end of the day is correlated with the quality of the car. It's going to be only a price between 500 and 1000 and that is the price that will be charged on a lemon and peaches will not be sold. So prices are going to serve a dual role. Not only they help the market clear supply equal to demand, right? By increasing and decreasing, but also they are going to convey the information to the part, to the side of the market who was lacking the information in the first place. Once they see, once buyers see a price lower than 3000, they immediately understand I am looking at a lemon, not a peach. So because of the prevalence of this problem in many different uh, markets, there has been some institutional and some market responses against market failure caused by adverse selection. To name a few, they are uh, signaling and screening devices, and I will get into this um, very soon. For instance, warranties. Warranties are a way to signal the quality of your product to customers. Reputation. If you manage to build a good reputation, customers will associate your uh, product to quality and there will be a um, and there will be a transaction in spite of not knowing um, the quality of the product. Experts, inspections, standards, certifications, those are uh, ways to signal the quality of your product in particular to the customers. The idea is you hire a third party to inspect the quality of your good and to deliver some sort of a stamp or a certification that says, I, this third party company, I am an expert in this and that, and I certify that the good sold by this firm is a good quality product. Or insurance could simply made mandatory. As I said before, because of adverse selection, some people might not end up getting insurance. To avoid that problem, you make mandatory, uh, you make insurance mandatory. In Canada, at least, when it comes to health and car insurance, they are both mandatory. Enrolling in MSP is mandatory and getting a car insurance is also mandatory if you want to drive. So, any questions before we take a break and then go on to signaling? Okay, let's take a break of, let's say 12 minutes and let's start again at 
So, any questions before we get into signaling? So a couple of things which are important about adverse selection. Whenever there is an asymmetry of information, then there is going to be some uncertainty, some risk. So whoever does not have the information is going to use expected utility or expected willingness to pay. When there is no uncertainty, no need to compute any expectation. And the mismatch between one side of the market that uses expectation and the other who doesn't need to use expectations is what causes adverse selection. Now, as I said, sometimes agents want to keep the information for themselves. Think about, for instance, somebody who is not very productive. He doesn't want his employer to know he's not very productive because he might not get offered a very high wage. However, Somebody who is highly productive wants to tell his employer, his future employer, yes, I'm highly productive, believe me. The thing is, if you just say that, there is no way the employer is going to believe you. Because whether you're highly productive or not, you will always say that. So signaling is a bit more subtle than just saying, I'm a good worker, or I, I am selling a good car, or I'm a good borrower, or... I am healthy. But the idea is to restore the balance of information in order to um, reestablish efficiency. So, asymmetric information causes market failure, and everybody, even those who have the information, may be worse off. Sellers in the lemons market do not sell peaches, but they wish they could, right? And technically speaking, buyers are willing to pay the price for that. It's just that they do not know if what they're looking at is a peach. And consumers in the insurance market might not get insurance because the proposed uh, premium is too high for their own taste. Again, I say might because it is also possible that the expected premium, for instance, when it comes to insurance, is low enough and a, a high quality um, customer would still accept. It is possible. Those who have superior information about a good may want to convey this information to others. The problem is that, first of all, the information conveyed must be credible. If you tell the insurance broker or um, your mortgage broker or your employer you are the good stuff, you are a high quality customer or high quality worker, that is not enough. This is not credible because everybody would say that. Nobody is going to openly say, I am not a good worker. I, can, uh, I, am, very, I am exposed to many diseases. I am very likely to default on my mortgage payments. Nobody is going to say that. So we need something more to make it credible. And this is why we use signals. It is an information meant to communicate about one's private information. Note that signal is a piece of information which, is, which can be sometimes noisy. As in, it can give you an idea about someone but it doesn't necessarily mean that person is a why is a high quality person not necessarily let's go through a couple of examples i talked about warranties before the break warranties are a way to convey the high quality of a good imagine that the product was bad well if the product was bad and there was a warranty on it everybody would use the warranty and the firm would have to uh, either exchange a product or proceed to a bunch of refunds. So the firm would not make a lot of profits if it's selling a bad product with a warranty. So if there is a warranty, it is kind of a way to signal to customers that it is a uh, good product. 
when they tell you there's a warranty of one year, pretty much what the firm is telling you is this device, this product is supposed to work for at least one year. Beyond that, it might not work, but then the warranty will be off. It will have expired. Lineups. Something as simple as a lineup can be a way to signal to people that the place that there is a lineup for is worth going to. If many people wait in line to buy the good, it must be a good one. For those of you who um, know about Hastings, so uh, on top of Hastings you have Burnaby Mountain with the campus, and as you go down, there is around Hastings and Willingdon, there is a restaurant called Anton's Pasta. It is a, so it's a, it's a pasta place, and it's uh, next to many different restaurants. There is um, Tentatsu, which is a pretty good sushi place. There is um, Osaka Sushi. There are some Thai places. On the other side now, there is a Japanese ramen and udon place. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a Thai place there as well, a Vietnamese place maybe. There's, there's a bunch of different restaurants. It turns out Anton's is the only one I see a lineup at every single day. All the other restaurants around do not have any lineup. So I always wondered, like, what's going on with Anton's pasta? And I went there once. I went there when there was no lineup. It was like later in the evening after, after dinner time, pretty much. And I could tell why there is a lineup. The quantities are huge. The quality is okay, but I can make better pasta personally. I have done better pasta. But for what you pay for, there is such a high quantity of pasta that I assume this is why people line up so much. So the lineup is a signal that maybe that place is a place worth going to for one reason or another. Certifications. I mentioned that you could get some uh, certification, some standard, some stamp from a third party expert which adds credibility to the quality of the good. Imagine the lemons market. Imagine that uh, a seller has a peach. The buyer doesn't know it's a peach or a lemon, but the seller does know. The seller could maybe uh, get the car checked by a mechanic or maybe by the brand of the car. Let's, let's say he's selling a Ford. He can go to Ford and say, I would like to get a, a whole checkup on the car. And then Ford or the mechanic can make a whole um, summary of the condition of the car. It can say tires in the, are in a good shape or the brand new, brakes are working perfectly fine, uh, the mileage is, is pretty low or pretty high, and the consumption uh, of gasoline is pretty high, pretty low, and so on. The idea is that then the seller can add this certification, this, uh, uh, this report to the ad on Craigslist when they sell the car as a way for buyers to see, huh, those are all the characteristics of the car that is likely to be a good car. And so if they take it that this is a good car, then they will be willing to pay the high price. The seller of a bad car will never get a certification if the certification is done truthfully, because if it's done truthfully, then the report will probably be bad. It'll be like tires are old, mileage is very high, one, uh, one light or one, um, yeah, the blinkers, I don't know, I forgot how you, I forgot, how we, um, I forgot what we call them. Yeah, some of them is broken and so on and so forth. But for the signal to work, so I said first, it has to be credible. These are ways to make it credible through different channels. The first one is a firm would never propose a warranty if the good if the product was not good. The second one is the time people are waiting, customers are waiting to get a product reflects the quality of the product. And the last one is certification is adding certifications are adding information to the um, to the description of the product. But the second thing we need for the signal to work is that it must be costly to fake. 
if it's not costly to fake, bad quality products would also acquire the signal. So good quality sellers, if they are the only ones using these signals, they can use the signal to distinguish themselves from bad quality products. But if it is not costly to fake, then anybody would use the signal. But if everybody uses the signal, then consumers, again, have no way to tell whether a good, uh, whether a product is a um, good quality one or a low quality one. So the signal must be such that only a certain part of um, the buyers or the sellers will want to use it. So to put things in perspective, let's uh, implement this idea of a signal in, 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 in an education model. Michael Spence, in 1974, so roughly four years after Arkelov's contribution with Market for Lemons, made a paper on asymmetric information about the ability in the job market. He made very simple assumptions so that we don't have too many moving parts and we can just gr we can grab the main, uh, grasp the main intuition of the model. Imagine you have two parties again. It is a job market, so we have a worker W. Well, he's not working yet, it's an applicant. And an employer E. They are both risk neutral. Again, risk neutrality is a simplification, but in real life, it's very unlikely. Making both the worker and the employer risk neutral is a way to make, uh, to make the analysis easier, yet we will, see, uh, we will still see uh, how signals can be used. So the worker's ability, which can be expressed in terms of marginal product, is denoted by A. It can either be high or low, but each with equal probability. Again, this probability could change. We could assume that one third of workers are high ability workers and two thirds of workers are low ability workers. Why not? We assume that the labor market is perfectly competitive. This means that the wage on the market will be equal to the ability or will be equal to the marginal product of labor. You should be familiar with this property by now. So a high productivity worker is worth a H to the employer. H, the <clears throat> H meaning high. <coughs> Sorry. A low productivity worker is worth AL, L for low. So obviously, a high productivity worker is going to be paid more, is going to have a higher ability than a low productivity worker. So AH is going to be bigger than AL. Now, we need to list the different strategies that each party is going to face. The employer has two possible strategies. Well, a bit more, but first is, do I hire the worker or not? And second is, if I hire the worker, how much do I propose the worker? So there is a whole bunch of different strategies. In fact, an infinity, because we have to propose a wage or not. But we have to propose uh, a wage, and wage can be a continuous value. The worker is going to face a discrete problem. Should the worker invest in education or not? Here, education um, corresponds to a college degree of whatever source, whatever sort. Now, we're going to make a distinction between, high, between how a high productivity worker considers education and how a low productivity worker considers education. 
Getting education is costly. Not only it is costly because of tuition fees and so on, but it is also costly because it is time that you could be spending working, but instead you spend this time studying. So that could be the cost of obtaining a degree could also be expressed in terms of foregone earnings. A highly productive, a highly productivity, uh, high, highly productive worker uh, will have a cost CH of getting an education, and a low productivity worker will have a cost CL. Now, I assume that a highly productive worker is smarter naturally, so for him, it will be easier to get an education, to get a degree, than for a low productivity worker. To illustrate that, we assume that the cost of getting a degree is lower for a highly productive worker than it is for a low productivity worker. So this is the model. We have an employer who is facing uh, an applicant we are going to go through different information structures, as in, does the employer know the quality of the worker or not? And depending on the different information structures, we will then look at the decision of a worker. Does he want to get education or not before applying to the job? We will, of course, the worker is going to compare his expected wage earnings with the cost of getting an education. Let's get into it. So, first of all, we assume that the labor market is competitive, so the wage is equal to the marginal product of labor. We assume as well that there is no disutility of labor. Working is the same for, in terms of pain, is the same for a highly productive worker or a low productivity worker. That's just a simplifying assumption. Now, another very simplifying assumption is the assumption that education has no effect on productivity. It only works as a potential way to signal one's ability. So here, getting the degree doesn't make you a better worker. You are a good worker by nature or not. This is not something you chose. So you only get an education to show off on your resume. That's the assumption here. So it's very important. The idea is that if school, if your education also uh, maybe gets you from low productivity, to low productivity to high productivity, then there is another dimension to education. Not only you can use it as a signal, but you can use it as a way to improve yourself. Abstracting from the improving part, we will see that it can still be uh, profitable to get an education under specific conditions. So, before we get into different information structures, again, let's talk about what the efficient allocation is. The worker should work for the employer, no matter what, and should not get a degree. Why is that? Because here, a degree is costly. There is a cost CH and CL, tuition, fees, foregone earnings, and so on. But the education in itself does not improve the worker. So in itself, education is useless. It doesn't make you a better worker. So. Getting an education technically is wasting money. Here. So let's go to the perfect information case. Both the worker and the employer know uh, the ability of the applicant, of the worker, AI. So the employer sees, can observe whether the applicant is highly productive or not. So it can propose a wage according to their productivity because this is what is being observed. So 
is going to propose a wage equal to AH if the worker is a highly productive worker because of the first assumption, labor market being competitive, the wage is equal to the marginal product of labor. And if it is facing a low productivity worker, then the firm will propose a wage equal to AL. Note that here, the wage is independent of education. Whether an applicant gets a degree or not, it doesn't matter because the employer can directly see the ability of the applicant. So the wage will be independent of education, but it will be dependent on ability because ability is being observed. If you do not observe ability, then you are uh, getting into the asymmetric information part or the imperfect information part and the wage will not be able to depend on ability anymore. And here we also have to look at the worker's decision to get an education or not. Will the worker get an education? He doesn't need to. His wage will not depend on whether he went to Harvard or not because the employer can see if he's good or bad. So, no need for an education. The wage will not be affected by that. Note that this is efficient according to the original efficient allocation. Now, let's get into imperfect but symmetric information. So, in this case, neither the worker nor the firm observe the ability of the worker. So the wage cannot depend on ability anymore. Could it depend on education? Well, let's check. Suppose first that the wage for somebody who has a degree is bigger than the wage for somebody who doesn't have a degree. Then the worker has to decide if the wage under a degree is worth getting an education. But now, the worker is not aware of his own ability. He doesn't know if he's a good worker or a bad worker. So if he gets an education, his utility will be, well, W degree. That's how much he's going to get paid. But the cost of education he's going to have to pay is uncertain for him. So he's going to take an average. If there is a probability of 1 over 2 that he is a good worker, and the probability of 1 over 2 that he is a low ability worker, then the expected cost of getting an education will be equal to 1 half CH plus 1 half CL. Every time there is a lack of information somewhere, you have to put an expectation. That's what uh, we do in, um, in this chapter. There have been other theories about non-expected utility and so on. This is not something I'm going to get into. It is uh, more complicated. Let's stick to expected utility theory. So, the left-hand side is the utility of our worker if he decides to go to college and get a degree. Note that here there is no log or square root or anything like this because the agent, the worker, is risk neutral. If the agent is risk neutral, the utility function is linear, remember? So we can just write it linearly. If he decides not to get a degree, he doesn't have to pay any cost, but he will only get paid a wage equal to W, no degree. Now, the worker will get an education if it's if it's worth it. So if his expected utility by getting a degree is higher than his expected utility by not getting a degree. Note that if he doesn't get a degree, 
there is no expectation anymore because there is no uncertainty. Note here that the education decision, what a worker will decide to do, is independent of ability. Why? Because he doesn't know his own ability. He doesn't know his own potential. So he cannot base his decision on his own ability. Now, what about the firm? Well, the firm does not know the ability of the worker. So the firm is not going to offer a different wage according to degree and no degree. The firm will offer an expected marginal product, an average between the two, one half AH plus one half AL. It's independent of education. And it's also independent of ability. Whoever comes in for a job interview is going to be proposed this wage. Now, if the wage does not depend on education, then why would a worker get education? The wage will be the same for everybody. It's an average of both ability levels. So, given this, the worker does not want to get an education. He doesn't get an education and it will be efficient. Well, it will be efficient if this is acceptable to the worker. But we have assumed that it is because there is no disutility of labor. So note how here I am going back and forth between the worker and the employer. This is a game theory problem, actually. Each party is maximizing his utility given the strategy of the other. So, first of all, the worker is gonna get a degree if this is satisfied. But this decision does not depend on whether the worker is a good worker or a bad worker. So, if this is satisfied, everybody is going to get education. But if everybody gets education, then nobody is signaling their own ability. So there is no point. If everybody gets education in this uh, model, the wage will not depend on education because the education does not help workers distinguish themselves. So if anyone will get education, then the firm still doesn't know who is a highly productive worker and who is not. So the firm will propose an average wage. But now I'm going to go back to the worker and see if getting an education in this case is the best response. Well, if the wage is this average ability, then the worker has no incentive to get an education because his wage will be the same whether he gets an education or not. So, the worker will not invest in education. And this is how you get a Nash equilibrium. You go back and forth and you, you check that each uh, um, party is playing his best response to the other party. Any questions? Okay, now let's get into the third case, which is more realistic, the case where information is imperfect and asymmetric. So now the worker knows his own ability, but the employer doesn't. So again, the wage cannot depend on ability because the employer will never propose a wage based on ability as it doesn't observe ability. In adverse selection and moral hazard, which I will cover next week, you always have to think about what each side of the market knows, what each side of the, of the transaction, of the contract knows, and 
they cannot base the price of the contract, here the price is going to be a wage, based on something that is not observable. So here, ability is not observed by the employer, so the employer cannot make his wage proposal depend on ability. So now we need to introduce the idea of beliefs. Suppose the firm believes that able workers get a degree and unable workers do not get a degree. So if an employer sees a worker, an applicant with a degree, then the employer will think, oh, that must be a good worker. So I'm going to propose him AH. If the employer sees an applicant with no degree, the employer believes, oh, it cannot be a good worker, so I'm going to propose a wage equal to AL. So this is what we assume. We assume the firm believes that. Then the worker has to decide whether to get an education or not, based on the corresponding wages. He knows his own ability, and he's going to compare his utility with and without a degree. Note that he knows his ability, so there is no expectation here, nowhere, because the worker is not facing any risk or uncertainty. So, now we need to compare the utility of getting a degree versus not getting a degree. If he gets a degree, he gets a wage equal to W degree, which is AH, but he's going to have to pay the cost of getting an education. If he doesn't get any degree, then he gets a wage equal to W, no degree. Since he doesn't get a degree, there is no cost on the right-hand side. Now, if you replace W degree and W, no degree with the actual wage proposals, then you obtain that this inequality boils down to the difference between abilities has to be bigger than the cost of getting an education. Now let's look at case by case. Let's look at a good worker versus a bad worker. A good worker gets a degree and a bad worker gets no degree if this is satisfied. Imagine first that we look at a, uh, at a productive worker. So then this will be CH. So for a good worker to get a degree, we need AH minus AL to be bigger than CH. Or we can reverse the inequality and say CH is lower than AH minus AL. And that's the first inequality here. Okay? Now, Let's look at a low ability worker. Here I would be replaced by L, but we're looking for a condition where the low ability workers do not get an education. So they do not get an education if this inequality is violated. So it means that CL would be bigger, the opposite, than AH minus AL, or if you flip the inequality, AH minus AL would be smaller than CL. And that gives you the second inequality. You do not need to learn those inequalities by heart. What you need to know is how to compare expected utility or utility with different decisions. Okay? And then once you replace by the numbers, you will find the uh, required inequalities. So, now, if this condition holds, if this red star condition holds, then the firm's beliefs about the workers are confirmed. Remember that we said the firm believes that good workers get a degree and bad workers do not get a degree. If this is satisfied, then 
the firm, the employer, is right to believe what he believes. So, if he believes that, then he's going to propose a different wage for each, which are competitive wages given the beliefs. If I think you're a high ability worker, I'm going to pay you the high ability competitive wage and, and, and uh, vice versa for low ability. The worker then is going to maximize his utility given the wages. And workers will be separated by education decision. High ability workers get a degree and low ability workers do not get a degree. So here, getting a degree is going to be uh, used as a signal to uh, prove your ability. Everybody is optimizing given what the others do. The firm doesn't really have a choice because the firm um, only uh, the firm is um, on a on a competitive labor market, so it can only charge competitive wages. And the worker, given given the wages being proposed, the workers are going to decide whether to get an education or not, depending on their ability level. We call this situation a separating equilibrium or a separating Nash equilibrium. We say it's separating because here education is going to separate high ability from low ability workers. So in a separating equilibrium, workers use education to signal high ability. The signal only works because it is too costly for low ability workers to send the same signal. So first of all, education, the college, de the college degree, is a credible signal. And second, it is costly to fake. So it is costly for low ability workers to get the degree. Getting the degree for them is a way to lie on their resume. It's a way to, well, they won't lie on the resume, but it's a way for the resume to tell a lie about them. The resume will tell that they are high ability workers while they are not. The allocation then is inefficient because some workers will get a costly education. Everybody will end up having a job, but some workers had to take an education to signal their ability, so they had to pay an extra cost compared to the Pareto efficient allocation where nobody needs an education. Now, I talked about a separating equilibrium, so there is going to be a pooling equilibrium. Imagine now that the previous condition does not hold anymore, and both types of workers will find it worthwhile to pursue education. So even the low ability workers will decide to get education because it is not too costly for them. In this case, it is not too costly for anyone to get a degree. So the employer will not be able to tell who is uh, what type anymore. So you cannot use education to tell types apart. Somebody who comes with a degree could also be a low ability worker because it is also a good deal for them. So the firm will then have to propose an average wage, an average ability wage, one half of AH plus one half of AL. So again, let's go back and forth here. Since any worker can get education and it's a good deal, the firm cannot use education as a way to decide on the wage. So the firm is going to compute an average wage. That's its best response. Now, if the firm proposes an average wage, an expected wage, expected ability, 
then the wage does not depend on education. So now let's go back to the worker's perspective. The worker is thinking, I could get an education, but I'm going to get paid the same no matter what. So why would I get an education? And so the worker's best response is going to be to not get an education. The wage does not depend on education anymore, and workers have no incentives to get education. If everybody could take education, and, and education was not making people better, then there would be no point of taking education because you would not be able to distinguish yourself from the rest of um, the rest of your students, of, of your cohort. And this is what we call a pooling equilibrium because all the workers, all the applicants, are being put in the same pool. In a pooling equilibrium, education is not too costly for any type of worker. So education cannot be used as a signal. No one will get an education. And you can apply that to other uh, instances. Think about warranties, for instance. If every product comes with a warranty, then maybe the warranty is not that costly to obtain. And so maybe some crappy goods, crappy products, also have a warranty. So the warranty will not be a signal of quality anymore. But in real life, you can find warranties that stretch from six months to three years. So a warranty of six months might maybe tell you something about the quality of the product. It might not be that good because they only refund you within six months of use. But as soon as you go to seven months, they don't refund you anymore. As in, it could break after that. We are not responsible anymore. But if it's a warranty that lasts three years, then it's like, whatever happens to three years, we got you covered. So that might signal a higher um, quality of the product. So let's talk about signaling again, but signaling as a waste of resources. Individuals who hold relevant private information can use signals to convey this information. We said that the signal only works, as in information is only credible, if sending the same signal is too costly for other individuals. If everybody could get an education in this model, then the education would not be a credible signal. That's education does not help me tell whether you are a high ability worker or not. And the signal must be costly to acquire and helps and only helps convey information here. So in this sense, sending the signal is inefficient because it corresponds to using resources without, uh, well, using resources that would not be spent if information was perfect. So let's go through another, a couple of examples of socially wasteful signaling. On the labor market, signal is, uh, well, uh, education can be used as a signal. Now, is it that wasteful? No, because at the same time, somebody who is a low ability worker might also become a high ability worker through his or her education. So in real life, education is not purely used for signaling, except for some specific programs. There are some programs which are kind of known for uh, not necessarily improving students. In particular, those programs tend to be selective. So they select good students in the first place. They don't turn them into better students. They teach them some stuff which is relatively easy for them. And then the students use the degree as a signal that they are smart. 
That happens for a couple of um, programs. Consumer product markets. I mentioned warranty as a signal. Advertising can be a signal. Price can be a signal. If the price of a good is high, it could be a signal that it was costly to produce or that it is a high quality product. Advertising takes different forms. In general, we distinguish three forms of advertising. Informative advertising, persuasive advertising, and advertising as a signal. Information, uh, informative advertising is a way to add information to the good so that um, consumers have a clear idea of the quality of the good. Persuasive advertising is more of a way for firms to sway customers, but the, the good is not necessarily of great quality. To give you an example, to give you a couple of examples actually, um, Brad Pitt recently made uh, some commercials with, uh, Ch with Chanel for Chanel number no. 5, I believe. So there is this whole, you know, aesthetics around perfumes, around fragrances. There is a bunch of other stars who, um, um, who endorsed uh, fragrances brands. George Clooney and Nespresso. I'm not a coffee drinker, so I cannot tell whether Nespresso is good quality coffee or not. But with or without Josh Clooney, the coffee is the same. But some people buy Nespresso after seeing George Clooney um, have a taste of a coffee in, a, in an ad. And the third form of, ad of advertising is called advertising as a signal. It is a kind of way for firms to show, to um, kind of prove, signal the quality of their products by literally wasting money in advertising. Why do I say wasting in this case? Because think about those billboards. Uh, there are some billboards, especially in the US, that is all black and in the middle you have the Nike sign. Nothing else. So it doesn't show you shoes or apparel or anything like this. It doesn't even tell you we are good, the future is ahead, we are the future and so on. There's not even like a motto or slogan. It's literally just Hey, we are Nike, we remind you that we are Nike, we are big, we can spend this money in useless advertising because this thing doesn't help you, like it doesn't give you any information about the products, it doesn't make you want to buy more, but it's a way to signal that we can waste this money because we make good stuff. In the corporate world, in the financial world, the debt equity ratio of a firm can be a signal of its financial um, health. So uh, if you plan to do finance at some point, take some finance courses, uh, getting a CFA or something like that, you might come across the debt equity ratio. A firm is funded through two channels, either debt, go to the bank, get a loan, the same way a consumer would get a loan to buy a house, or equity. Equity pretty much is stocks. You issue some stocks, people buy those stocks, which becomes your funding as a firm, and in exchange, you give up some of the ownership of the firm. Whereas when it comes to debt, the bank doesn't own the firm at all, as long as the firm repays its loans. The debt to equity ratio can be used as a measure of financial health of a, um, of a firm. I believe it's also called the leverage ratio and uh, that can be used as a signal to uh, invest or not in a company. Legal disputes. In the legal world, when uh, a trial is about to start, some, sometimes there can be what we call pre-trial settlement demands. Let me give you an example. Imagine I buy a product from Safeway and I discover after eating it that the product was um, had been expired for two weeks and I get sick, I get food poisoned. I get food poisoning out of it. 
I decide to sue Safeway and say, hey, first of all, your product was expired by two weeks. And second, well, I got food poisoning out of it. So Safeway could wait, hire its lawyers and go to the trial, go to court, let's say three months later. Or sometimes they contact whoever is suing. So in, in this case, Safeway would contact me and say, hey, let's not go to the let's, let's, not, let's not go to court. Let's settle this before going to court. And in this case, Safeway would propose me some money to drop my charges and say, yeah, no, I'm good. Actually, I don't need to sue anymore. Safeway could say, for instance, we give you $5,000 and you walk away. You, you don't need to go to court and so on and so forth. This can be used as a signal that Safeway doesn't want to go to court. And they might not want to go to court because they, they might think it's going to be costly or they might lose. So that can be used. At least I can use this signal. I'm like, ooh, Safeway is... Uh, Safeway is, uh, is fearing the trial. So maybe I can bargain for a higher amount of money and I can say, I won't settle for 5,000. I will settle for 20,000. And well, that's pretty much a bargaining, um, a bargaining problem. And in bargaining, rejecting an offer or maybe delaying your response could be a signal. Well, if you reject the offer, the signal is, I'm not okay with this offer. But if you delay your answer, this could be interpreted as a signal of, ooh, we are looking at an amount that the other person might agree on. She is taking a lot of time to, um, to get that, um, well, to answer. So maybe she's on the fence and maybe I just have to propose a slightly higher amount for this person to accept. Live entertainment and restaurants. I mentioned lineups for restaurants, but you can think about concerts and performances like sports games or um, yeah, concerts, um, comedy shows and so on. When you see that within two hours of um, of um, putting tickets for sale for, let's say, Beyonce concert or Drake concert or this kind of artists, you see that within two hours, tickets are sold out. That's a signal that the performance must be good. Marriage, dating. A fancy car, gifts can be a signal of appreciation, as in, I care about you, I want to go further, and so on and so forth. But you can even think about, before getting to the fancy car and the gifts, you can think about um, communication dynamics. I'm sure most of you guys, guys and gals, have dated, and you might have been in a situation where maybe you like the other person, and you might be thinking, do I answer now, or do I wait for two hours before answering this person's text? As in, if I answer now, it looks like I'm always on my phone, desperate to hear about the person. Or if I uh, wait for two hours, or maybe a day, or maybe two days, maybe it's going to look like I'm more laid back. I don't care as much, so maybe I'm going to have a higher kind of bargaining power in the relationship. Personally, I am not into signals at all. When it comes to dating, I don't think about, oh, I'm going to... I'm going to answer this three hours later because she's going to think this or that. I answer whenever I see the text. Done. And I answer with what I think, what I want to answer. There's no such... I don't play games, but that's to each their own. Okay? So, let me summarize everything again, quickly, because it's going to be useful for the next lecture as well. Asymmetric information happens when one side of the market has knowledge that the other side of the market doesn't have. Why is it a problem? We saw that because of that, whichever side doesn't have the information 
is going to compute an expected utility or expected profit or expected willingness to pay. That might not be enough for trade to happen, <coughs> although trade would have happened if information was perfect. Turns out, even when information is imperfect but symmetric, trade can still be efficient. So really, the main issue here is not the fact that information is imperfect, rather it is the fact that it is asymmetric. Note that it is not always the case that there will be a market failure. If this number, which is the expected willingness to pay of the buyer, if this number is higher than 3000, then because the buyer is willing to pay a high price for both cars, then trade will still happen. So first, perfect information, everybody observes everything. Second, imperfect information, nobody observes nothing. And then asymmetric, one side's one side observe, observes uh, the information, the other doesn't have the information, doesn't observe. Because of this uh, problem, then trade is going to be less than efficient and often, oftentimes, the adverse type, as in the low quality good or the, the low ability worker or the customer which is at risk is going to be the one making a transaction, but the high quality goods, high quality customers will uh, not be part of any trade. Now, to solve this problem, we can, we can solve the information issue by one way or another, convey this information to the side that doesn't have it, that doesn't have access to it. And this is what signaling is about. Signaling is about kind of giving a piece of information that can be interpreted as um, as a um, credible representation of the information. Again, I say can because there are cases where the signal is not working. So I used education as a signal as an example where we have a worker and an employer. The worker has to decide whether to get an education or not, whereas the employer has to decide which wage to propose to the worker. So again, we have interactions. It is a game theory problem. Each party is going to maximize his utility or his expected utility or profit or expected profit given the other party's uh, decision. So if information is perfect, then the wage can depend on what is observed. And what is observed is ability or quality. So no problem with that. Same as element market. If, in, if information is imperfect but symmetric, so nobody knows nothing, then the wage cannot depend on ability. It could depend on education because education is observed. We see whether somebody got education or not. But it turns out that it is not optimal to make the wage depend on education because any worker, either all the workers will find it worthwhile to get an education or none of them at the same time. So the education decision will be independent of ability because workers do not know if they are highly able workers or, uh, or unable workers. And then the firm will um, not make the wage depend on education. It will still be efficient, however. 
In the last case, where information is asymmetric, then since the employer does not observe ability, he cannot, ch he cannot uh, choose the wage based on ability, but maybe he can use education. He's going to use education if education is too costly from, for one side for one type of worker, but not too costly for the other type of worker. This way, workers, who are, going to, workers are going to use education to distinguish themselves from the other type. If this is satisfied, then we are in a separating equilibrium. So it is a technical requirement. If I give you CH, AH, AL, and CL, you could check this condition and see whether the equilibrium will be a separating one or a pulling one. It is a separating when one type of workers, one type of agents uh, use a signal and the other type doesn't want to use the signal. However, if the signal is not too costly for either type of agent, then anybody can get education whether they are good or bad. So in this case, the firm is lost again. The firm cannot use education as a way to decide, as a way to see who is a good worker and who is not. So the wage in this case will be an average. It will be independent of ability and of education. Knowing that, a worker will then not have any incentive to get an education because he's going to get paid no matter what. Whether he gets an education or not, he's going to get paid the same amount. So in this case, nobody will get an education. Everybody will get paid this amount, which is the average ability of a worker. And in this case in particular, it will be efficient. A pooling equilibrium is not necessarily efficient either. Always compare these equilibria with the perfect information equilibrium. Remember, under perfect information, it's pretty much perfect competition, and so the result is efficient. In the separating equilibrium, some agents, the good type, the high ability workers, are going to get education, which represents a waste of money. It is just a way to signal that you're good, but it doesn't make you better. In the pooling equilibrium, nobody gets an education because it is not useful for anybody, so it's more efficient in this sense. And we went over other examples of wasteful signaling. Not always wasteful, that depends, but you can always argue. So address selection is a problem that we encounter in real life very, very often. Simply because most of the time, some agents, some people have an incentive to keep some information for themselves. Or sometimes they have an incentive to disclose this information in a credible way. Not always. If you are a bad ability worker, you do not want to show, you, don't, you do not want to signal that you are a bad, that a low ability worker. You would like to lie about it ideally. That's it for this lecture on adverse selection. Have a good rest of your week and see you in the next one. Bye.